Well, hi YouTubers. Hi, I'm back with a six mile sixty books, and it is um, the twelfth of May. I am um, doing two today. I did a ten k yesterday. My leg is absolutely knackered because full of metal. I've mentioned that before. Um, and I was the last person to finish. It was timed, and I was the last person because people thought they were actual runners, proper runners, and I can't run because of the uh, where my foot is kind of designed now. So I had to walk it ten k, and I did it. So kudos to me. And I got a nice medal, which is around here somewhere. And yeah, but today I'm knackered. So I came last in a 10k run. Okay, so this is the book In Heart of the Sea by Nathaniel Philbrick, the international bestseller, the incredible true story that inspired Moby Dick. Right, now I got this in a sale. Let me read the blurb, okay? When the whale ship Essex set sail from Nantucket in 1819, the unthinkable happened. A mist speck in the vast Pacific Ocean and powerless against the forces of nature. As this was rammed and sunk by an arranged sperm whale, and the twenty crewmen were forced to take to the open sea in three small boats. Ninety days later, only a handful of survivors were rescued, and a terrifying story of desperation, cannibalism and courage was revealed. While the greatest sea yarns ever spun, in the heart of the sea is a true story of the extraordinary events which inspired Herbert Melville's masterpiece Moby Dick. And here's the thing. I've never read Moby Dick. I know how it opens. <clears throat> Call me Ishmael. Because that's been mentioned many, many times. It's like the American classic novel, isn't it? Okay, it's everyone's everyone's read Moby Dick. Or The Catcher in the Rye. Or The Wizard of Oz. Or Gorm of the Wind. And yeah, I've never read... Well, no, I've never read Moby Dick. Okay. This book is so good. Now, I knew nothing about Moby Dick. Obviously. So I went in actually quite blind. I never really compare it to. So, the level and depth that Nathaniel Philbrick has done in this book is absolutely extraordinary. Now, it managed to really kind of pull me into this world. The world of Nantucket, where virtually everyone there was descended from like, the original settlers of the area. And any outsider, if they're married into, if they're from the mainland, they are viewed with suspicion. They're not really accepted. This world of superstition and this world of cl close community... It is just a fantastic, fantastic world. Let me read this a little bit here. This is how it opens. Okay. It's just one bit to you in. It was the later remembered, the most pleasing moment of my life. The moment he stepped aboard the whale ship Essex for the first time. He was 14 years old with a broad nose and an open, eager face. Like everyone else in and every other Nantucket boy, he been taught to idolise the form of a ship. This might not look too like much, so to throw a rig and then change to the wolf. But for Thomas Nicholson, it was a vessel opportunity. Finally, after what seemed like an endless wait, Nicholson was going to see. Incredible opening. Absolutely incredible, incredible opening. And then, further along, this is more about Thomas Nicholson, because he's like our main protagonist of this story. Because, obviously, first of all, he's a minor. He's the youngest like person of the crew. So we see a lot of this work through his eyes. Okay, but this is how Thomas Nicholson on how he, he also is accepted in the community. Okay, Thomas Nicholson was on the outside looking in. The happy truth was while Nicholson's mother Rebecca Gilson, the Gibson, was a, was an Nantucketer, his father Thomas Nicholson had been born from Cape Cod, and Thomas Jr. had been born in Harwich in 1805. Six months later, his parents moved him and his sisters across the sounds to Nantucket. It was six months too late. Nantucketeer took a dim view of off right, off islanders. They called them strangers, even worse, coos. A term of disparagement, no, originally reserved for Cape Codders, are born into accused orders and lucky enough to be born on the mainland. Now, this kind of mentality is kind of like closing cave thing where everyone kind of knows your business. It is also one of the reasons that Thomas was going to see at 14. But. On an island where so many families could claim direct descendants from the first 20 or so settlers, the Gibsons and Nakatisans were without the network of cousins that sustained most Nantucketeers. Oh my god. Said Obed Macy, when inhabitants are connected by consanguinity, as this, which adds so much harmony to the people, to their attachments to the place. So, yeah. Thomas may play with them, may go to sea with them, but deep down he understood that no matter how hard he might try, he was at best only a cure. 
he's Thomas Nicholson, 14 years old, is going to see to kind of like earn his business, kind of like become a man, mature, okay? However, in his own community, he's seen as an outsider. He's not really, really accepted. Which kind of, this just position, okay, between like these closed-minded enclaves of very, very early American settler society, where they just start off so small and so managed by their own kind of population. And they don't like outsiders. They don't like anyone coming in. Everyone who's not a member of their family, or from the first set of families, is a foreigner. There you go. But this is the thing where, it also, because this is only page 25, it talks about how race and slavery also play a part in this. Now this bit here, okay. As Pratt's account suggests, a wailing voice was the lowest rung on a maritime ladder for a seaman. And tenants like Thomas Nixon and his friends might look for their first voyage as a necessary step in the beginning of a long profitable career. But for the men who were typically rounded up by shipping agents in cities, such as Boston, it's a different story. So the beginning of something shipping out of a whaling world often seen as a last and desperate resort. Mentality difference. For the Antarcticians, going out sailing is a big achievement. To everyone else, it's not. The kind of enclosed mentality is kind of pushed, is kind of like, kind of like we're on the mountain looking down at the masses kind of thing, when the reality is absolutely different. The seven black sailors who agreed to sign up for a voyage aboard the Essex, Samuel Reed, Richard Peterson, Lawson Thomas, Charles Shorter, as I share, had William Bond and Henry DeWitt, had even fewer choices that Addison Pat would have had in 18, um, 1820. None of their names ever appeared in Boston or New York directories for this period, indicating that they were not landowners. They were basically... They were basically treated quite badly, to be honest. As they boarded the packet full and tuck it, uh, I'm sorry, the packet full and tuck it, the seven African Americans knew at least one thing, they might not be paid well for their time for an Antarctic whaler, but they should have been paid no less than a white person with the same qualifications. Since the time when Native Americans had made up the majority of the Antarctic slave force, the island ship owner had always been paid men according to their rank, not their colour. But this had to do with the Quakers and slavery leanings, as well had to do with the harsh realities of seaboard life. In a tight spot, a captain didn't care if a seaman was white or black, just wanted to know if he could count on a man to complete his appointed task. So black sailors who were delivered to the island of as green hands were no regard as equals. That kind of thing. But the thing is, there's one bit here, okay, where I love this. I absolutely love this. This, this bit made me, this bit, I just, I just adored. Okay. Is when... This entire book is a story, put down. It's a story of how missed opportunities and chances where it could have gone totally different. Apart from the actions of just a few individuals. However, one of them, I totally applaud what he did. Even though it changed the outcome for so many people. One of the black sailors. There you go. This bit I absolutely loved. Something happened in Antichams that proudly influenced the moral of the crew. Henry DeWitt, one of the Essex African American sailors, deserted. The risk act came as no surprise. Sailors fled for whale ships all the time. On the Greenham realised how little money he was likely to make at the end of the voyage. He no sense to stay on if he had better options. However, the timing of the desertion could not have been worse for Captain Pollard. Since each whaleboat required a six-man crew, it's now left only two ship keepers over whales were being hunted. Two men could not safely manage a square rig ship the size of the Essex. It was something to kick up. They were finding it almost impossible to shorten sail. Yet Pollard, in a hurry to reach the offshore ground by November, an alternative but to set out to sea short-handed. I love that. Can you imagine that if... Henry DeWitt had stayed on. The Essex may not have sunk. They could have, they may, not, may have made it safely easier. There'd be no Moby Dick. There'd be no great American novel, if you will, by Herman Melville. Actions of one man change the outcomes of everyone. However, Henry DeWitt, respect the guy, why don't you? Whatever happened after your, you, you left, I hope you had a long and prosperous life. One thing though this book also does really well is talk about how when they go to these small islands that the um I can never pronounce this word in the Agabacos, okay where there is this kind of like mentality of how they kind of view the I mean the turtles here grow up to 
meters they last hundreds of years and the thing is as with kind of karmic power i think going on with this narrative he's presenting um phil Beck's presenting is all right let me just read this bit here on the morning of october the 22nd thomas capel a boat steer from plymouth essex decided to play a prank not telling anyone else from the essex what he was up to he was here with Chappelle. he was fond of fun at whatever expense but a tinder bought a show with him and they ever searched the island for tortoises. Chapel secretly set the fire in an underbush. It was a hot and dry season. And the fire soon burned out of control, surrounded the turtles, hunting and cutting off the route back to the ship. With no alternative, they were forced to run through a gauntlet of flames. Although they singed their clothes and hair, it's just in the resulted, not trimming of the Essex. Now, so prior to the whale thing, a member of the crew set a fire on an island, which basically destroyed the ecosystem for a while. An absolute well, it's the last impression on the island. So, even though I'm unintentional or not, you sit there thinking maybe some kind of karmic god going, got karma going on. Can you imagine okay, the animals who were destroyed? Hundreds of thousands of animals who were destroyed, okay? And it was reported that Charles would be one of the first Isindi Galapagos to lose the tortoise population. So, essentially, the actions of the Essex kind of pushed an endangered species, well actually helped a species become endangered in the first place, the tortoises are, or some of them. So, when the whale hit, which is a technical called the attack, okay, it's, I don't know if it feels karmic, but it feels like you screwed around so much with nature, and nature's now having her revenge. Because, now, when you think, now, I haven't seen the film in the heart to see, when you think of these sailors stuck in these boats you always think of them as being like rowing boats don't you like some of the titanic or something like the small boats actually no they were quite big they're quite well equipped they could fit like several men so they're quite big boats and they had provisions and actually managed to get back onto the essex to actually get some provisions before they had to kind of like set loose and try to find their way home or to safety but The thing is, this is when another moment of ineptitude comes in because this is when it, the deed has been done. Okay. Pollard, the captain, sped out before the two copies of Bodius Navigator and his list of latitudes and longitudes of any in the if any other nations islands in the Pacific Ocean and began discussion of what to do. Okay. So the thing is, they're discussing what to do, but the thing is where they really, really mess up. Okay is when they can go to Tahiti because the ignorance of the Society Islands in particular Tahiti is even more extraordinary since 1797 there had been a thriving English mission on the island Tahiti's Royal Mission Chapel was 712 feet long and 542 feet wide bigger than any Quaker meeting house on Nantucket so can you imagine, once again, due to a catalogue of errors, they thought that begun to Tahiti, there'd be, and cannibals were mentioned here, okay, they'd be killed by some kind of cannibalistic tribe. And whereas like Tahiti had been taken over almost 20 years earlier by a missionary, and yeah, they could have got safety there, but they didn't, and they kept going. And then, further along in the book, it, it goes on to what they had to do, and this is, this is known, this is known, it's been known for years. They had to resort to cannibalism. Okay. Now, one thing I love about Phil Brick is this book is leading up to the cannibalism because that is what is most what I knew about the cannibalism of the Essex. I knew about sort of the Essex, about the cannibalism that's by Moby Dick. But when it comes to the cannibalism, this is it. He is brief. He doesn't need to go into detail. For separating the limbs from the body and removing the heart, they sewed up the remains of Cole's body as decently as they could for committing it to the sea. And the event began to eat, even before lighting the fire, the men eagerly devoured the heart. They got sparingly a few pieces of flesh, they cut the rest of the meat into thin strips, then which they roasted on the fire where elves were laid out to dry in the sun. Chase insisted that he had no language to paint the anguish of our souls in this dreadful dilemma, making it all the worse for the thought that any of the remaining three men might be next. He may not, may knew not them, the first mate wrote, to lot it would fall next. After die, I'd be shot and eaten like the poor wretch we had just dispatched. Next morning, they discovered that the flesh, strips of the flesh, had turned a rancid green. 
I immediately cut the strips which produced, provided them enough meat to last it for seven days, allowing them to save what little bread they had left, for which Chase called our last moment of our trial. Yeah. Yeah, that, that is what they were used to do. It is heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking as well. But the thing is, compared to another story um, that happened back in the 1970s, Alive, where that plane crashed into the Andes, where they tried to maintain a vow of silence relating to what they had done, and then it soon broke. No, they, the people who found the plane found the remains, and it all came out what they were used to do. The crew of the Essex, when they are found and they are covering it, they actually get the message out that they, they are honest by what they have to do. To ease their conscience of what they have to do, even though the Nantucketers, the Nantuckians, don't really blame them for what they had to do, they understand, okay, it's a vibe of the sea after all. But they are honest in what they have to do, and I absolutely respect that. They didn't hide from what had they having to eat the remains of their lost crewmen. The main survivors, Pollard was animated by a fierce and desperate compulsion to tell his story. A sight the gaunt, wide eyed ancient mariner of courage poem poured forth, each having detail to the wedding guest. So the Pollard told him everything how his ship had been attacked in the most deliberate manner by a large sperm whale. How they headed south from the whale boats, how his boat had been attacked once again by an unknown fish, and how they found an island where a few fell on fish, but any substance. He told them that three men still remained on the island. He told them how the rest of them set out for Easter Island. And how Matthew Joy had been the first to die. He told him how Chase's boat had been separated in the night, and how rapid succession for black men became food for the remainder. Then he told how, on separating from his second master's boat, he and his crew were reduced to the poor necessities of casting lots. He told of how the lot fell to Owen Coffin, and with composure and resignation submitted to his fate. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine that? Just the, just the horrifying nature we had to do of lots being drawn so someone has to die so the rest can live. It's an absolute heartbreaking tale. And I can understand the appeal for American culture and history. Why, why this book? Or why so the Essex is so important? So, I have never read a book like this before. Uh, I'm not reading the seafaring books at all, but this book was just absolutely incredible. The film I'm actually now going to check out eventually, and I might even read Moby Dick one day <laughs> and actually do a review of it after everyone else. It wasn't compulsory to read it in school. So, this book is just fantastic. It is just well written, the history, the research is extraordinary. And congratulations to Nathaniel Philbrick. You did an amazing job. Of making someone who's never read a book, Carson, able to actually visualise the world of the Nantucketeers of the early 19th century. So thanks a lot. I'm Sonofi. And bye, Mums.